Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Aviv. He wrote a book, well, he wrote a couple of books, but we're gonna be talking about the Acid Watchers cookbook and book that he wrote. And he is really an expert on gastroesophageal reflux disease, what to do if you have it, how to heal from it, and please welcome him to the show. Hello, Dr. Aviv, it's nice to meet you. Hi, Chef AJ. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I'm grateful to you for sharing your personal story, inspiring so many people, and really introducing people to not only a way of life that's healthy, but a fun way to do it. So it keeps people coming back. And that's uh, an extraordinary gift and an extraordinary talent. Thank you. Well, thank you. And you know, it's it's really interesting because it was your fans and patients that actually requested you be on the show. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. People were writing and I hadn't heard of you. And I'm so glad I have because, you know, reflux disease is very, I mean, I host now that I know you, if I ever do the GI health summit again, I'd want you for one of the experts because it's such Thank a you. common, it's a, such, such a common disease. It, it, you know, we only think of one disease right now, right? COVID-19. Uh, but there are others. And uh, reflux disease in the United States affects 75 million people, 1 billion worldwide. So it's an extraordinary common disease condition and uh, people love to eat. So you're going to have consequences, as, as we all know. Right. And, and there, there is things you can do with the food because so many people are just they just they get diagnosed and then they take medication. Exactly. I mean, this is the salient point. Um, and when you said the GI summit, it's only lately that gastroenterologists will talk about food uh, for the longest time. And still, there are some well known academic gastroenterologists today that say it doesn't matter what you eat, you know, uh, food doesn't matter. Uh, it was when I first started this years ago, it was extremely disparaging and frankly, disheartening, but I could see the results because we're able to actually look at the throat very easily with people wide awake, and we could see the effects of what food does in terms of healing. Uh, it's, it's one of the great things one can do as an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And frankly, I've been encouraging other medical specialists to take a look, but they're not interested. Thankfully, speech language pathologists have been trained to do this, and they could take a look with a little camera. Uh, we're not going to show any gross pictures today, but you can actually see a swollen throat shrink just with a food-based approach. It's amazing. You mentioned that sometimes GI doctors say it doesn't matter what you eat. I've heard, you know, people with cancer, they go to their own, oh, it doesn't matter. Just, you know, you're, you're sick, have whatever you want. You know, but you guys aren't really taught nutrition in medical school. That's uh, such an incredible point. Um, I, I could make it even more basic than that. The one thing we ask our patients when we have talks like this, there's only one take home message as far as I'm concerned. Tell your health healthcare professionals what you eat. On the other side, when I give talks to physicians and other healthcare professionals, I say to them the take home message before they head out is ask your patients what they eat and drink. And that almost never happens. You've been a patient, I'm a patient, well, yes, I'll, I'll stroll in with my cookbook and I'll give it to the doctor. And they'll say, the first thing they say is, well, do you follow that diet? I say, yes, I had to because I wasn't feeling very well. So is that how you got interested in this? Did you have G gastroesophageal reflux? So I didn't even know. Uh, I was director of head and neck surgery at Columbia University Medical Center in the 90s. And I woke up at three in the morning one night choking, literally gasping for air. My patients now call it a jump up because I'm jumping up in the middle of the night and I couldn't breathe. Uh, it was very scary. I knew what to do once I calmed down. I actually closed my lips and I, I sniffed through my nose and that pops open the airway, believe it or not. So after this event, I went to my doctor and I explained what's going on. And I got the first of seven to eight years of antihistamines. It's your allergies. Your allergies are acting up. And this literally went on for years. Finally, I realized it was 
acid reflux. And that, that be, began the, the journey. One of the things that, that we knew with our patients uh, who had head and neck cancer, when we took out the cancer, reconstructed the, the defect left by the cancer, one of the most common complaints were people couldn't swallow. And sure, some of it had to do with bulky tissue, radiation, chemotherapy, et cetera. But very often we realized that they all had acid reflux that was never treated. And in this particular situation, perhaps coming from below acidity caused swelling or something we learned much later, the acidity of what you're eating and drinking can cause swelling. And once we sort of clicked onto that, we realized that if we get this swelling down, imagine trying to eat something if you have an orange stuck in your throat. When the orange becomes a pea, it's easier to swallow. Sometimes it's just like that. We're reducing swelling enough to restore swallowing to a not quite a preoperative state, but a state where it's much more readily accomplished. So that's how this all started. It was a, a, an intense personal experience. Is reflux ever not caused by diet? And if so, what percentage? Yeah, it's very, very hard to tease all that out. There are uh, studies that one can do to see if someone has what we call pathologic reflux, meaning the acidity that's coming up is more than what you would normally see. There are some uh, data points that one looks at. But one of the things that no one talks about and I think it's so important if we could communicate this on your show, it would be a, a great help to so many people. A lot of people come in and they don't have heartburn. They have what I call throat burn, not literally a burning throat, but they're, <clears throat> they're clearing their throat. They're a little hoarse. Uh, they have post-nasal drip. They're coughing. They have a lump in their throat. And, uh, that's from acid reflux. Now, a lot of people think, well, it's, and we thought this for many, many years, it's acid flying all the way up. And I can give you some scenarios where that would happen. For example, the stomach takes three to four hours to empty. If you lie down, say two hours after your last meal or snack, 50% of the stomach is full. So you lie down, gravity goes away, whoosh, acidity comes up. But a lot of what happens is not reflux, what I call acid influx. So can I give just maybe 60 seconds on the science? So there's an enzyme in the stomach, stomach called pepsin, P-E-P-S-I-N. Pepsin lives in the stomach. It breaks down protein in an acidic environment. The stomach's very acidic. It's pH 2. Pepsin gets activated below pH four, four to two. It's a logarithmic scale. So it's a hundred times more acidic in the stomach than literally almost anywhere else in the body. But pepsin can float out of the stomach, sit in the esophagus, in the chest, in the throat, in the teeth, in the sinuses, in the nose, in the middle ear spaces. And when you eat or drink something less than pH four, what you eat starts eating you, meaning causing swelling. Thankfully, and this goes really right into how, you, how you've based so much of your uh, health efforts, it's what you eat. Thankfully, there are only six foods less than pH four. I call them the dirty half dozen. Two of them are unhealthy, four are healthy. The unhealthies, which really have no nutritional value, are flavored beverages in a can, bottle, or box. Uh, uh, the bottled iced teas, the flavored sodas, the flavored sparkling waters. A lot of people come in and say, well, I have, I have to be careful with mentioning brands here, but they say, I have flavored sparkling water and it's all natural. Well, what it is, is less than pH four and slowly you start to get more and more hoarse. So that's what happens. Now, there are four healthy things, and this is where people get tripped up, but we have answers. Citrus, tomato sauce, not tomato, vinegar, wine. Citrus being lemon, lime, orange, grapefruit, pineapple. Now, as it turns out, 
You can neutralize a lot of the acidity with different combinations, say in blenders or in cooking. Um, lemon or lime rind, for instance, the skin is above pH five. It's not as nowhere near as acidic as the juice itself. And so that's what we spent turning kitchens into food labs years trying to get these combinations. So things taste good. It's still low acid, high fiber, nutritionally balanced, but to get in these flavors that we're missing when you're extremely stripped. So, but people that don't have reflex, are these foods that you recommend they don't include too? Because the, the only, it's funny because so many things on your don't have or your dirty dozen list or your, are, are things that I don't eat or recommend coffee, chocolate, uh, alcohol. I would never recommend those to anyone to eat just for health, uh, but vinegar would be a really tough one for me. Right. So I yeah, vinegar, it. right. Vinegar is tricky. And, but for instance, we came up with, with numerous uh, plant-based uh, dressings that have vinegar, we've just done things to neutralize them. Uh, and that's something we, we can talk about. Um, there are other plant-based dressings that have a vinegary taste or citrus in them. And if it's done in the right combinations, you can, you can neutralize it. And that's why the food-based approach really depends on what symptoms you bring to the table. If you're having rip-roaring heartburn, that burning sensation in your chest, we suggest some things. If it's all up here in the throat, we suggest other things. And there are many ways to do it. As an example, uh, I use a watermelon cucumber blendy. I blend it. I don't like to juice because you lose a lot of the fiber as, as you've described in a lot of your work. Uh, and I completely agree, but the lycopenes in watermelon, the lignin and cucumber are very, very powerful, natural anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, flax meal, which, you know, crushed flax seeds is flax meal has a hundred times more lignin than even cucumber. So you can put a tablespoon of flax meal in this blendy, and you have a, a very anti-inflammatory beverage that's, I believe, healing. Uh, as a side note, as it turns out in the time of COVID, uh, there's a micronutrient in flax meal called herbacetin. Think of herbs. And herbacetin binds to a certain site in the cell. It's called CL3 protease, where, which is where COVID goes if it gets into the cell. I'm not saying this is a treatment for COVID-19, okay? But it will compete for where COVID goes in the cell. So there are other benefits to an anti-inflammatory food-based approach under these circumstances. And you recommend that people follow this diet, not just, you want, recommend at least 28 days, right? Or at least- so, Yeah, now when we're, uh, as you know, we write books for say 75 million people with reflux disease that we're never going to see in the office, never an examine. So we cast initially a very wide net. Then as we see people come into the office and we actually see their complaints, you know, what is your complaint? Are you hoarse? Do you have heartburn? Whatever it is. And depending what the exam looks like, I will modify our recommendations. People say, but your book says, I know what my book says. I wrote it. And some people should be on a 28 day plan, but maybe if your complaint is hoarseness and you don't realize that the diet Dr. Pepper you're having every night at midnight to wash down the box of Krispy Kremes is not the way to go, you know, we can fix that. So it may not be 28 days that are necessary once you're under the guidance of someone who's taken a look and knows what's going on with your body and with your complaints. So Without knowing who's going to be starting, we recommend after speaking with your healthcare provider, I'm not saying we should run out and do things. I think one of the key things we have to get across, I know you do that before all your, your talks and your books and, and your conferences, is this is not meant to be pure medical advice. Please check with your provider because everyone has different issues and different things that may or may not be okay. So 28 days for everyone, no. When you see me, we'll almost always modify it. 
Well, do you still take patients in, in New York where you live, either virtually? Oh, absolutely. Or in I'm, I'm, yes, thank you for asking. I'm, I'm at a practice called ENT and Allergy Associates. Uh, we are in an insurance accept environment, so we take lots of insurance. Uh, our website is entandallergy.com. And we see patients uh, prior to the pandemic, frankly, from all over the world since the pandemic. Uh, it's been more local traffic, but now it's getting back to at least from around the United States and, of course, in what we call the greater New York metropolitan area all the time. Right. So we have Tracy watching live who says she's been following the Acid Watchers diet for over a year now and would like you to write another cookbook. So uh, thank you, Tracy. Uh, we, we had plans to do that. We were recently speaking to our literary agent, uh, Steve Troha with Folio Lit. Uh, the, the problem in the last year plus is we've been inundated with patients with uh, significant issues related to COVID-19, a lot of them ear, nose, and throat related and has completely taken us off track. That's why I really haven't been able to post in a while. Uh, it's required a tremendous amount of attention. I could tell you what we're seeing uh, you may have heard of something called COVID long, right? People had COVID usually in the first go round, well before vaccines became available. And they had certain symptoms. One of them is shortness of breath with normal chest imaging. And it's a very debilitating symptom because they can't walk because they feel short of breath. However, if the chest is normal on imaging, usually this represents a nerve injury that could be treated with physical therapy and a version of the acid watcher diet, believe it or not. Very cool. Very cool. So Diane saying she had to have surgery to fix her reflux. If she had found your work before then, maybe she could have avoided it. Well, again, so it all depends on what the exact symptoms were, uh, what the findings were on exam. Again, we, I mentioned pathologic reflux. If someone has what we call traditional heartburn, so you feel that burning sensation, you take medication, the medication works, you do certain testing to show that everything is working normally. I'll give you an example. If the esophagus, which connects the throat to the stomach, is moving slowly, it should take one to three seconds for food to go from the throat to your stomach. Let's say it takes five seconds or six seconds. If you, the surgery involves tightening the bottom of the esophagus. If your esophagus is not moving well and you tighten the bottom, what's gonna happen? Things are gonna get stuck, right? So you have to be very, very careful about who's getting the surgery and when this happens and make sure the indications are exactly right. Generally, and it's tough to make generalizations, generally for throat symptoms, you want to be very, very careful with doing surgery for the lower esophageal muscle because there very often, again, not always, but very often food-based approaches can be more helpful. Great. Thank you. you know, people are commenting that it's hard to find a good salad dressing that doesn't contain some kind of acid or, I mean, that's basically yeah. what salad dressing kind of is. Yeah. Listen, the, we can debate the, <laughs> the salad dressing thing. And I, I don't want to, people who are worried about nuts and uh, nut-based dressings, which are, are plant-based, but you know, the oils may bother people. I mean, there are ways to do it. We certainly discuss it in the, uh, in the acid watcher cookbook, but there are ways to do it. And again, it all comes down to symptoms. If, uh, if someone has throat swelling, they're hoarse, their throat clearing, they're uncomfortable we can get the swelling down and listen, if there's certain foods someone has to have, you know, we're not going to stand in their way. So a lot of this is give and take. We give and take with our patients all the time. Some people must have certain things. We can only make recommendations. And again, it's all depending on the severity of symptoms. If someone has such severe throat swelling that they can't swallow or they can't talk and it may require four to six weeks of significant diet modification to get the swelling down, to get them functioning again. Well, it's a give and take.
Yeah. Well, Mandy's saying she drinks uh, lemon water in the morning and other people saying they used to drink apple cider vinegar, but for somebody suffering from reflux, that's probably not a good idea. Right. So the whole apple cider vinegar, lemon in the morning and the morning water, it, people forget about pepsin. And that's why I brought this up in the very beginning. If pepsin's sitting here and you have throat symptoms and you're pouring less than pH four down your throat, that pepsin is going to get activated. The throat is going to swell and your symptoms are going to get much, much worse. And we could see it. I mean, vocal cords should look like violin strings. When people are hoarse and they look like sausages, you know, something's up. And if it's not cancer, if it's food related and we can make alterations in what you eat, and as I talked about, say, the smoothies and juices that reduce inflammation, what I call food steroids, in quotes, of course, uh, why not? You know, I never thought about food as a chef, but if you ever did another cookbook, I would love to be challenged by you and submit some recipes and you tell me what I can and cannot use, because I love your idea of taking a high acid food and, and neutralizing it. Because like you had mentioned in an interview, I heard taking something like a carrot with, um, with tomato. And it, it, it's not just great for your protocol, but nutritionally it, it makes it better. And actually it would make the marinara sauce more delicious because traditionally tomato sauces have a lot of sugar. So it's like, I think we should, co co we could collaborate because I, I mean, I love that, that, that would be uh, one of the professional highlights of my life. And yeah. you, you have extraordinary ideas. Uh, I believe you have led a movement uh, towards longevity, really. And to collaborate would be an amazing thing. So I yeah. want to do that. Yeah, I love a challenge. It's like an iron chef. You just tell me, use these, don't use these. I would love to see what I could come up with because to me, that would be fun. Yeah, we have a fun comment from Sunita. So what you eat starts eating you. I mean, literally, literally. Yes, that's, that's the way. So it, it goes like this. Um, do you have soda? Eh, you know, the usual amount. Come on, give me more than that. What's the usual amount? Once a month? Twice a month? Oh, twice a month. I said, okay, so twice a month soda. And they say, well, that's okay, isn't it? I said, well, let me put it to you another way. I only pour battery acid down my throat twice a month. Ever I saw a video once where in a, in a, in a poor country, they used Coca-Cola to clean the toilet. <laughs> I mean, oh, this is well known, right? This is well known. So the, the thing is, until symptoms come up, and it usually is very surprising when people are coming in with throat clearing, a runny nose, congestion in the nose, a lump sensation, Almost always, and you've heard this too from your guests, from people you interact with. Oh, it's my allergies. Oh, it's, it's that April. It's that May. Oh, here we are in October. It's my fall allergies. Well, you may have allergies, but let's start with the basic question. What are you eating and drinking? What do you have for breakfast? What do you have for lunch? And it's so funny because typically when I'm asking these questions, people are like pondering and pondering like I'm asking some differential calculus equation. How do you solve it? No, I'm just asking what you eat and drink, but no one ever asked them. So they have to think about it. And if, if we can accomplish that, tell your doctors, tell your healthcare professionals what you eat or drink. And on the provider side, ask your patients, ask your clients what they eat and drink will go a very, it sounds so simple. It never happens. I'm a patient. Unless I roll in with my cookbook, it's not happening. Very few doctors, unless you have a lifestyle medicine doctor, ever ask a patient what they eat. Well, maybe we'll start a trend. Yeah, absolutely. So Rhonda says that after her gastric sleeve surgery, she got really bad reflux. Is there a correlation between those surger that surgery and having reflux? Again, so... We, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, what was the technique of the sleeve? Uh, was there some motility issue with the esophagus leading down? Uh, there are a lot of things that we don't know. It's extremely hard to answer these general questions. I'll, I'll give you an, an even uh, more relevant type of question. Uh, intermittent fasting is very, very popular. 
Uh, and a lot of longevity centers say that you got to do it. Well, what people don't understand, it, it often unmasks acid reflux disease. If you think about it, the traditional treatment for a stomach ulcer 60 years ago was five small meals a day. So now let's get rid of five small meals a day because that's going to keep the stomach acid under control. Let's just have one or two. Now, most people will lose weight, they look fabulous, but I know because I see them in the office and they're coming in like this or this. And again, I'm not saying people out there who have lost 72 pounds and, and you know, over a year from intermittent fasting, don't stop anything. But if you're having heartburn, you're having throat burn, at least bring it up to your, your healthcare coach, your your provider and have a discussion because maybe there's a simple solution that gets you over the hump a little bit so you can continue doing what you're really trying to do. And if you think about it, the Acid Watcher Diet, our, our tagline is the kitchen closes at 7.30, right? So why do we say that? So it's a it's an intermittent fast. If, if you go just by the, the, the letter, 7.30 at night, you're gonna start eating 7.30, six to eight uh, in the morning the next day. So you're, you're, you're baking in a, a 12 to 13 hour fast. So you're getting uh, a lot of the health benefits. I know the intermittent fasters will, are going to push it out. I've seen the data, 14 hours, 15 hours. There's a sort of a, a magic number there, but you'll still get a lot of the benefits. Well, I think the important thing is to just not eat before laying down. I, so many people eat their largest amount of food after dinner, to bedtime it's and then they wonder why you know that's that's it and it's interesting one of the one of the treatment options under those circumstances and there are many many circumstances where people just simply cannot stay up three to four hours after the last meal or snack uh there's a natural substance uh which medically we call alginates but the term is really algae from the sea so it falls under your umbrella of plant. And what algae does, and there are many different forms, algae floats to the top of the stomach. It acts like a raft and it prevents acidic things from coming up. So you can take alginates to effectively prolong your evening. Sometimes you just can't stay up three to four hours, try and alginate. There are some commercially available uh, uh, alginates out there. Some compounding pharmacies will actually work with algae, uh, depending on uh, how savvy your pharmacist is. Uh, the, the two most popular ones right now, uh, one comes from the UK and Canada. It's called Gaviscon Advance. Uh, there's another one from Napa called Reflux Gourmet. I know it's a funny title, but what, what these substances are, are algae. And uh, it, it definitely gives another angle on how to accommodate lifestyles that just can't simply follow what we suggest for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Here's a question from a live viewer, Julie. Is esophageal spasm caused by acid reflux? Great question, Julie. We don't know exactly what causes esophageal spasm, what triggers the irritation, uh, if we go with the theory that it's a nerve hypersensitivity of some sort, then yes, foods less than pH four will irritate certain nerves, both from the autonomic nervous system and sometimes even the cranial nerves, which are nerves from the brain that can control uh, esophageal movement. So, you know, that's quite possible. But the idea of reducing inflammation which is so much a part of what Chef AJ does, I think is a very, very good approach. Again, it's gotta be done in concert with whoever is, is really managing your spasm. Right. Did, um, did you wanna, yeah, I know you, you have some slides. Did you wanna share those now or? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, because I also have questions that people actually wrote in. So yeah, that'd okay. be wonderful. Right, great, let's see if I could share this. Hang on, and here we go. So, 
So this is what the uh, cookbook looks like. As we discussed earlier, is it acid reflux? That's something coming up from the stomach or is this what we call a pepsin mediated acid influx? That is the acidity of what you eat and drink. I just want everyone out there to start thinking about what you're putting in your mouth. These symptoms we uh, briefly went over, it's not heartburn, right? It's hoarseness, cough, throat clearing, what I call chaching. I can't spell chaching, but I could say it. It's <laughs> huh, 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 right? Yeah. Sore throat drip. Uh, I showed some references that discusses this. So it's, it's really about pepsin. Again, pepsin in the stomach, floating out, gets activated when exposed to very acidic substances. And that's the basis of a lot of the throat symptoms, inflammation from pepsin activation. And how do we treat it? Uh, there are lots of traditional medical treatments. Obviously, we'd like to focus on diet and lifestyle. Uh, our hashtag is food is medicine. The Acid Watcher Diet is a book that I published in 2017, uh, which introduce some of these concepts. And the, the basic tenet is acid watcher diet, low acid, high fiber, nutritionally balanced. I found uh, in my practice that deprivation diets where you're excluding uh, an entire class of, of, of uh, macronutrients and, and Chef AJ has written such great pieces on this, how people just completely eliminate carbohydrates. We lump all carbohydrates together suddenly. Uh, someone said to me, oh, your diet has 60% carbs. Yes, but it's complex carbs. It's, it's the carbs you should be having. Uh, and that's, that's very important. I always get worried when people come in and they just lose entire food groups. Uh, there's, there's science on that. And that's something that I think is very, very important. Of course, it's got to taste good. If it doesn't taste good, we're not going to get very far. So for traditional reflux disease, heartburn, I talk about something called the dirty dozen, which are foods that loosen the lower esophageal muscle. The concept being the esophagus connecting the throat to the stomach. The stomach, which contains acid, is protected by something called the lower esophageal sphincter. Foods that lower the esophage lower esophageal sphincter, loosen the lower esophageal sphincter will allow acidic things to come up. And that's when you get the traditional heartburn. So we can look at it. We discuss the foods less than pH four, the flavored beverages, the bottled diced teas, and what I call the four under four. I want to stress that tomatoes are okay. And really the only alcohol less than pH four is wine. And again, in the time of, of COVID-19, alcohol lowers the immune system. That's something just to keep in mind uh, in these times. The foods that loosen the lower esophageal sphincter, and Chef AJ talked about two of them, coffee, chocolate, alcohol, mint, raw onion, and garlic. Because it turns out if you cook onion and garlic, you take away its what we call carminative effect. Carminative means loosening of a lower esophageal muscle. Coffee and chocolate are particularly an issue because not only do they loosen, they bring acid up. So you have to be cautious with that. And again, it's symptom driven. If you have terrible heartburn, this is not going to make things better. So one of the issues that was brought up uh, from a lot of our initial readers, and I'm, I'm grateful to everyone, was that they, they felt that it was a little too strict and and we were missing a lot of foods that, and flavors that we typically like. So we specifically address that uh, in the cookbook. And I say pizza and burger. So this is a veggie burger. No one should get too worked up. And this pizza is actually a cauliflower crust pizza uh, with macadamia nut ricotta and tomato and basil. I know there are issues with nuts, so I don't wanna get anyone too worked up but just understand from a plant-based perspective, when you're thinking and dreaming of a pepperoni pie and white flour, uh, and that's the taste uh, in your mind, we do eat with our eyes. 
And this is as yummy as it looks. What's the concept? The concept is you could neutralize acidity by combining various flavors. One of the things we, we use a lot of in our smoothies and juices is non-dairy milk to neutralize the acidity of uh, say an orange or pineapple or berries or cherries. So you, you keep the nutrients, you're just neutralizing the acidity enough to get it above pH four, pH four being the quote unquote magic number where pepsin gets activated. So that's the concept. And we really push that to the limit as chef AJ was so kind to point out in our tomato sauce, we add carrot. So carrot has some natural sweetener, but it's very alkaline. It's so concentrated and it, it tastes delicious. Uh, and all you out there can, can do this, go to any supermarket and line up your first 10 uh, tomato sauces in a jar. Invariably, the first five ingredients will be high fructose corn syrup. And by the time you get to tomatoes, maybe ingredient eight, nine, or 10, if you're lucky. Now, you may go to the best supermarket in the world and it's only tomatoes, bravo. But as you look around and do your own research and see what's in the supermarkets, you, you just you know check the labels. Uh, I think anyone tuning in knows Chef AJ's mantra about checking labels. Um, it's, it's a big part of, of how you bring yourself into figuring out what you're putting in your mouth. And this is... Uh, you know, one easy way to start. You're, you're all doing it already, I'm sure. And anyway, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, right now. But th those are just some of the basic concepts that, uh, you know, we share. And let me, uh, okay, so I, I took, the slides are gone, right? They're not occupying right, your right. screen. Okay, good. Yeah. good. Well, Angela says, love, love, love this doctor. So that's cool. Hey, when you mention mint, do you mean like the fresh herb mint? Do you mean like a mint you put in the mouth? You candy. Mean mint. mint candy. Now, mint, even the fresh mints will loosen a little bit. But typically, if you're, when you tend to cook carminatives, they will lessen their uh, effect on the lower esophageal sphincter. So cooking will... The raw form you'd have to see. And again, it, it brings me back to what are your symptoms? You're having traditional heartburn. Be careful with things that go right to this area. It's not a lot of things, but it can happen. And certain things you can do to mitigate that. Uh, it's all a question of what are your symptoms? How severe is it? And what does it look like, right? So don't suffer in silence out there, folks. Go see your healthcare professional, get looked at. Um, it's great that people take the bull by the horns and start making changes right away. I applaud that, that's, that's huge. But let someone take a look. It, it really makes such a difference. So can you see people virtually? Cause don't you have to look? Yeah, so that's, so uh, look, our, our practice has certain rules. We're, we're not allowed to see people outside of the New York, New Jersey area because of all sorts of medical legal constraints. Um, and precisely because we can't go very far without a look, it's, it's not terribly helpful. Uh, it's great for you know, the mental health sciences. Uh, you can't readily examine the brain, but we can readily examine the throat and the sinuses and even the esophagus with people wide awake with very, very tiny instruments uh, that give us the picture. And one of the wonderful things about that, these techniques is that we could compare before and after someone comes in, they have these problems in the throat, their horse throat clearing, the, the constellation of symptoms, they come back six weeks, nine weeks, 12 weeks later, and literally side by side, they could see it. You don't have to be a laryngologist to see that the swelling goes from you know, a puffy pillow to a little peak. So, uh, and, it, and, it's, and it gives people the inspiration to continue. They know they're doing the right thing and they can see the benefits of their toil. Right. So Mandy, who's watching live says, are flavored herbal teas as bad as flavored water or drinks? Because I personally like to drink mint herbal tea unsweet. It's very, very different. Uh, the flavored waters uh, are acidic. 
there's a myth that coffee and tea are acidic. They're not. Caffeine will loosen and bring acid up, but the pH of most of these substances is six. So generally, I've not seen that to be an issue. Okay. There's a question. Is cashew milk okay as a neutralizing ingredient, asks Karen? Yeah. So, yeah. So, Karen, yes. I use the acronym OSCAR, like the Oscars, O S C A R. So, oat, soy, coconut, almond, rice. The C could also be cashew. Any of the non dairy milks will, will do that. In general, most pediatricians don't want. Uh, anyone over age two having cow's milk because of casein. There are other issues with that as well. So yeah, uh, the nut-based milks are fine. The uh, protein, I mean, they're, I mean, there's an endless list of, of non-dairy milks that, that will, they all work. They all work. And nobody has to be eating any kind of dairy. I don't care what their age is. That's even if they eat meat, I don't, I don't know. I never understood this whole dairy thing. And by the way, I don't have a problem with nuts. I think they're healthy, but with, with my story, with my weight and food addiction, they just didn't work for me, but I think they're, they're perfectly healthy foods. Good. Good. Yeah. Thank um, you but, for that clarification. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm not anti-nut. My husband eats peanut butter all day. Well, peanut butter is technically a legume. I just, just, those, it was, it wasn't a food I could moderate. Seeds, not, not, not so bad for me. You know, um, there are so many people that sent in questions knowing you were going to be on when we sent it out to our mailing list. So I want to get to them. Uh, the first one is from Annie and she says, I've been following the diet for almost four months. I would say I feel about 90 percent better, give or take, depending on the day, but I still have some lingering mucus. Is this normal? Do you hit a plateau for a while after healing? Will I ever get to hundred percent or is 90% the best I'm going to get? So Annie, great questions. And thank you for your interest in, in, in what we're doing. So let me explain the mucus story. We all produce, all of us, one to two liters a day of mucus from our nose and sinus. That's a lot of volume. And what do we do with it? Normally, we swallow it. We don't even realize it's there and we swallow. We swallow a thousand times a day, okay? So that's the, the background. Now, if your throat is swollen for a variety of reasons, let's say it's either acid reflux or acid influx over a period of time, the throat is swollen. And so the throat acts like a shelf and catches that mucus, right? And that's what you're, <clears throat> we're back to the chaching, that's what you're clearing all the time. So what you've done, Annie, is you've made some changes which have reduced the swelling. Now the shelf is shrunken down to a little twig. There's still a little drip, drabs of mucus on that. That's probably up to your, I'm calling it your 90%. So maybe there's a, if not an allergy, maybe there's an environmental sensitivity. Maybe there's something you can do to reduce the mucus. Maybe there's something going on with your sinuses. So if you haven't already, I would either run this by your ear, nose, and throat doctor, your regular doctor, your allergist, just someone to make sure that that part of what's dripping down is under control. Great. Thank you so much. And she has another question. I don't know what this is. She says, since Tito's is okay, I'm wondering if marijuana edibles are okay as well. Okay. So Tito's is a uh, corn-based vodka. Uh, the potato and, and corn-based vodka have pHs above eight. Um, edibles. I mean, I have no issue with edibles. I have an issue with smokables of any stripe. Uh, people don't realize that as soon as you ignite something, you release something called a TIF. That's a tumor initiation factor. Um, so it's it's a, a whole world of danger as you start to ignite things. Edibles, completely different. But again, uh, that's my, my personal feeling on it. You have to use this in the context of what you're using it for. And again, I would discuss this with your healthcare provider that knows you best. Right. But see, I've never liked the word. Okay. Cause okay. For what is she talking about just for reflux? Cause I wouldn't think alcohol and, and marijuana is okay for health. Right. Exactly. So that's, that's where it gets very tricky. And that's why I, I always try and bring it back to symptoms 
Why are you here? What's bothering you? What does it look like, right? What does it look like? And then what's the treatment plan? And that's why the, the questions, that's why, and I apologize in advance to people online that on my Instagram, I, I get these questions. I, I can't possibly answer questions without an exam. Once I examine someone, then we open up a, a, a world where we at least we have a shot to help you. But blindfolded with a random yeah. question, it's I don't mean to be rude, but I, I can't help. Well, and and, and again, I apologize. I should have told you, don't feel like you have to answer any questions. That it's are not that. I, I want to answer whatever I can. But you, you understand, without the context, as you right. just brought up, without knowing the why and what it's for, it's very hard to say, OK, do this. OK, do that we can back it up a little bit and say, is it okay to have flavored soda? I say, you tell me the health benefits. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So she's saying if she's feeling 90%, should she start reintroducing foods or wait to get a hundred percent? You know, my, my feeling is of something, and I'm, I'm putting, you know, when there's a saying, Dr. Goldhammer always says, when you're a hammer, you see everything as a nail, but, but I work with people on mostly weight loss, food addiction. And, and it's like, it's like they want to go on a diet and then they want to eat the foods that made them fat and sick. And if something made you sick, why would you want to introduce it if it's not healthy? I mean, just because you know, vodka is not going to, a certain vodka is not going to affect your reflux. I mean, we know now from the study out of Oxford that all alcohol causes a brain shrinkage, that, that no amount is regarded as safe, that it, it creates cancer and every cell touches. So, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but if I was, I'd say, no, <laughs> it's not. But, but you're, but it, so Chef AJ, you bring up something very, very powerful. I don't know if people saw this, but the American Society of Surgical Oncologists, these are cancer surgeons, put out a statement in the last five years saying exactly what you just said. Now, I don't want to upset people that, oh my God, I'm going to have my drink. I'd rather die than have my Chardonnay and not have my Chardonnay on and on and on. I get that. I get that. And there are a lot of things you know, we want to do it, especially in a, in a world over the last two years where so much is taken away, uh, our, our patience has run thin. And I understand that. But and it, we do get confusing messages because the government will say it's OK for a man to have two drinks a day and a woman one drink a day. But those of us treating cancer completely disagree. And we're much more aligned with Chef AJ on this. Great. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, someone literally sent in, one person sent in 18 questions, and I think that's kind of a lot. So maybe you, you could do a consult with this person. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll try to pick the one that's the most general, you know, that's not pertaining to just that unique person's uh, medical condition. Like, do you offer telemed consults for those who do not live in New York? So the answer to that is no. But my understanding no. is if they go to New York, they could have a consult. Absolutely. And as I said, we're an insurance accept environment. I take some 36 plans. It's not, you know, we want to see people and we make it, we accommodate uh, our patients as best we can. Right. So there's really nobody else that's really doing exactly what you're doing for this. Well, I, I can't say that at all. Okay. I, I believe I believe there are ear, nose, and throat doctors and gastroenterologists and pulmonologists and speech language pathologists and allergists all over the United States that have expertise in this. Um, it, it sort of goes to what, what we, we uh, discussed before we went on air that uh, uh, when I initially came up with, with the acid watcher diet concepts years ago, I got a lot of grief from from uh, the gastroenterology community. And there's still some gastroenterologists that say that, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat, uh, it won't cause reflux, et cetera, et cetera. I fundamentally disagree. I see the changes that take place, the pepsin mediated inflammatory changes. So I disagree with that. Uh, but having said that, are there people in your communities that may have some understanding? Uh, they may, they may. Um, and we, we do see people from all over the United States. And very often, the people that do come see us, say, from Tulsa, from Fort Lauderdale, from Arizona, will have seen their local experts, and they want another opinion or a different take. Right. Great. Thank you. Well, here's one that, that is more general. So I'm going to ask it from Mimi. 
I read that plant-based proteins produce less pepsin. If that's true, do you recommend eating a whole food plant-based diet for people with reflux? Absolutely. I think the, uh, my colleague and partner at ENT and Allergy Associates, Craig Zalvin, uh, published a paper on using alkaline water and what he called a Mediterranean diet. He was specifically referring to a plant-based diet to treat reflux disease and had results as good as taking a proton pump inhibitor, which is a very powerful uh, acid reducing medication. So there's actually good science on this. Uh, there's no question that a uh, plant-based diet is gonna help your reflux disease for, for many reasons. Great. Um, Faith wants to know, because you had mentioned vinegar, does all vinegar cause reflux or does it depend on the acidity? Because the, the vinegar that I prefer is a little bit lower in acidity. It's 4% versus 6%. Does that make a difference or for some? So again, uh, I don't think vinegar causes reflux. What vinegar does is if it's below pH four, and I've yet to find one that isn't, uh, and we, my patients periodically bring in vinegars that they're told are, are, uh, relatively alkaline, none of them are. And we have a fairly sophisticated pH testing uh, equipment set up here. So it's, it's pepsin activation. And again, I think we're, you know, there, there are thousands of foods out there. You know, vinegar is now at Mount Rushmore. Let's, all right, vinegar, you know, listen, if you have to have vinegar and, you could, and you're symptom free, have your vinegar, but understand what it does. So you know, there are probably ways, and this is where I hope I can collaborate with Chef AJ on coming up with a dressing. And we do, as I said, in the Acid Watcher Cookbook, we use vinegar liberally in our oh, dressings. Yeah. We just neutralize it. Right. I, that, yeah. Oh, boy. But that is that is a tough one when people say, well, I can't have lemons, limes, and, and vinegar. And it's like, oh, my gosh. But you can't. Hang, let, let's talk about lemon or lime. What do you like about lemon or lime? It's, it's the tangy flavor, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a pico de gallo where we use lime rind, tomato, cilantro. That's it. That's it. It tastes just like whatever pico de gallo you've ever had. We don't put jalapeno in there because we want to survive the night, but uh, it tastes amazing. The rind will get you those flavors. And this is, and rind is above pH five. So let's not Let's not toss out lemon or lime. We use it. We use the rind. This is how we get around it. Now you're seeing where we're edging here. And uh, I believe that putting our heads together, getting Samara uh, Aviv in there, who, who came up with a lot of the concepts with, with the cookbook to, to push the envelope. You know, when you, when you have a, a tomato soup on the cover, you know, we've done something. It's shocking for reflux. What, you're having tomato soup? How'd you do that? So we're going back to carrots, but maybe we should be going back to other things. So I, I think there's a world out there that's yet to be explored. And I think we're on the tarmac, thanks to Chef AJ. That's cool. I want, um, beet, beet also could be good in a tomato sauce to make it sweet. Fabulous, yeah. fabulous. Yeah. I, I, do sun-dried tomatoes do the same thing as tomatoes? Because they it, are- Again, it all depends, you know, what, what's in there. Generally- Tomate, raw tomatoes are okay. They're, they're all above pH four. Now, some people have a reaction to tomato, okay. But if you're looking at pH and people say, oh, I can't have tomatoes. No, it's the sauce because what happens if you're making the sauce from tomatoes from your garden, bravo. But if it's in a can or a jar, paste, it's a law, it's called Title 21. You have to acidify anything in a can or a jar. And the FDA is very strict about that. So we're trying to get around that. Great, thanks. Mimi asks, does drinking alkaline water 9.0 or above deactivate pepsin? If so, how much alkaline water should one drink in a day? And is there any downside besides the cost? So uh, alkaline water will, will deactivate pepsin. However, in terms of neutralizing acidic foods, it's not concentrated enough. Because initially we thought, okay, let's just pour some alkaline water on this uh, lemon water and we'll be fine. No, that's why you have to use the, uh, the dairy-free milks because it's not only uh, the pH, it's the concentration. 
So you may have some transient pepsin deactivation, but the pursuit of pepsin deactivation with water is going to be extremely difficult. And that's why without getting too much into the weeds here, the idea is use some of the smoothies and juices, and it could be some of the things say on the acid watcher diet support group, the regular group or the relaxed group on Facebook, where they've posted hundreds and hundreds of fabulous recipes using some of these concepts, neutralize, it's yummy. And I think you'll, you'll have a, a way to be satisfied. Great. Thank you. This is a question from Sanjay. I've had LPR for over two years. All the tests I've had, including the 24-hour pH impedance, came back as normal. However, in spite of following the acid watcher's diet, taking PPIs every day, I take 30 milligrams of Dexalent twice a day, drinking alkaline water, sleeping on an incline, I still get symptoms. My symptoms are isolated to the thoracic area. I get a burning sensation and sour mouth upon waking up in the morning. I do take an alginate sometimes before going to bed, but still get the symptoms. Um, the past few days, I've been getting the symptoms during the daytime as well. I'd appreciate any advice you can disseminate. Yeah, again, the, uh, we I would have to look at the study um, because the, these studies were the pH studies. They're, they're actually numbers that you look at to see severity. We have to look at the motility to see what's going on. There, there's a way to answer it, but I need... You, you think this is a lot of information. It's not enough information. And really, if you've been through all this, whoever did your pH testing probably would have some idea of what your next steps uh, should be. Now, Chef AJ, uh, in terms of timing, you wanted this just under 60 minutes? Well, I, don't have, but it's, I mean, I did. It's for, up to you. I'm, but it's I'm, just, I'm, if, I'm, if you have time, it's just, I mean, it's up to you. Course. You can come back or we can keep going. No, no, the only, the only reason I sometimes keep it under 60 is then I can repost on Instagram, but it's such a good conversation. If you have more time, I'd love to keep oh, talking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Cause it took a while to get you on. So, I mean, cause this is such a, 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 an important topic and a lot of people suffer and unnecessarily from this. So here's a question about chocolate and the pH of chocolate. If the pH of chocolate is above five, how does that negatively affect the LES? So cough, this is one of the myths. And uh, if you go to uh, entanalogy.com, you could download what I call the uh, dumbfounded dozen myths of reflux disease. It's a, a two-sided uh, one pager that, that goes through some of these myths. And one of the myths is that coffee and chocolate are acidic. They're not. The, they're above pH six. They have physiologic effects. What caffeine, which is in a lot of chocolate does, uh, and it's, it's from a, a compound called methylxanthine, if you want to get technical. But what methylxanthine does is it loosens the lower esophageal the lower esophageal sphincter, and it increases acid production by the stomach. So in and of itself, if you don't have heartburn as a symptom and you want a morning cup of joe, have it. Uh, if you want some vegan chocolate, have it. Uh, would I cut yourself off, say, around the middle of the day? Yes. The uh, post-dinner double espresso is not the wisest thing because aside from being up till four in the morning, your lower esophageal sphincter is not going to work for several hours. Right. Uh, there's a question. What is the best test to rule out Barrett's esophagus? And maybe you could talk about what Barrett's esophagus is. So Barrett esophagus is when you have stomach lining creeping up into the esophagus. So the anatomy, I'll just tilt down. So, and actually everyone at home can do this. If you take your thumb and put it on your sternal notch, that's where your collarbones meet in the middle and you just drop your pinky straight down. That's the length of your esophagus, believe it or not, just that. And if you curl your fist in your other hand and put it in your pinky, that's where the stomach is. Nowhere near your belly button, okay? So that's the anatomy, all right? Now, stomach, when the stomach lining starts creeping up into the esophagus, anytime organs have tissue that don't belong there, that is generally potentially precancerous. 
So when stomach lining is creeping up into the esophagus, and the way to think of it is a flame, the flame is the acid in the stomach and it's sort of heating things up and the tissue is climbing up, right? So when you have stomach lining where it shouldn't be, in this case, the esophagus, it's called Barrett esophagus. And under the microscope, there's certain stains which show this stomach lining. And it's a small, very small, but finite risk of getting esophageal cancer, which is one of the fastest growing cancers in America the last 30 years and Europe too. So the question again, now that we talked about Barrett a little bit was, forgive me. Um, is Jeff there a Hedges. test? Is there a, what is the best test? Yeah. So, I mean, I, the way to make the diagnosis is to biopsy the esophagus and or stomach. Uh, and the way that's done is typically during something called upper GI endoscopy and typically done under some type of sedation. Uh, I did pioneer a technique called transnasal esophagoscopy or TNE, which is a way to look at the esophagus awake. There are very specific indications of when to do that. For instance, if people have a history of ulcer disease or bleeding ulcers uh, or abdominal pain or nausea, then the awake unsedated form is contraindicated. You must look at the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine. You must. So that's what people get upset. They said, well, you do this awake thing, but your symptoms indicate that something much more serious may be going on. I could tell you the genesis of all this was when we started doing these awake unsedated procedures, we saw a lot of inflammation and we asked patients to get the full exam, but in their mind, they felt they had a complete exam and they'd come back with very serious problems years later. So now I won't even do it. If you have a history of ulcer disease, abdominal pain or nausea, you must, must have the stomach looked at. So how do you look at the esophagus? Basically for all intents and purposes, do a sedated exam under certain specific circumstances where we know people will follow up, yes, we could drop a little camera and take a look and see what's going on and give you some idea. Right. I mean, you know, everything has a risk benefit ratio, but this, don't, do you feel like the things like antacids and, and proton pump inhibitors are, are overused? Because I recently had a guest on Dr. Nathan Bryan, who's like a nitric oxide expert, and he said they're not so great for- long Yeah, so, so we'll talk about, there, there are two different classes of drugs. The the pepsid or famotidine are called uh, H2 receptor antagonists. They're, they're a version of antihistamines. The, the classic antihistamine is histamine one for sinus disease and, and allergies. Histamine two blocks acid production, but they're extraordinarily weak. Uh, they only suppress 40% of acid for four hours. Physiologically, it's like a glass of milk. Uh, any milk, <laughs> dairy milk or non-dairy milk. It's not very powerful. Uh, their risks are, are very, very small. And, and really in the time of, of COVID-19, it, it was shown that uh, Pepsid at high doses lessens the inflammatory response if COVID gets into the cell. Again, it binds to that site called CL3 protease. So I'm not, I'm not so quick to trash Pepsid these days. Uh, I never was. A lot of physicians take PEPs at 20 milligrams twice a day prophylactically just for that purpose. So in terms of, it, it takes the edge off. Now, the proton pump inhibitor class is a completely different uh, level of acid suppression. Typically, 80% acid suppression for 12 hours or more. There were some observational studies, so not really good scientific studies that showed that it may predispose to dementia or bone fractures. These studies have been disproven. So they're a lot safer than we realize. And listen, some people, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the, the gentleman that just said they went through all these things, they're still very symptomatic, is on Dexalan 30. Well, we don't want people to walk around horribly uncomfortable and in pain. That's not fun either. 
Uh, and it's not the end of the world taking a proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor. If you have to, you have to. You know, what we're trying to do here, obviously, is try a food-based approach, but not to the exclusion of using medication, not to the exclusion of having testing. All I'm asking is, let's define the playing field. Once the playing field is known, then you could really step-by-step step address the issues. But these blanket statements, don't have a PPI, don't have an H2 blocker, it's not good. It's this, no, no, I disagree. You know, let's have a look. Let's define what the problem is. Let's get you better. Let's get you comfortable. And then let's decide on a plan long-term. I guess what, what I'm meaning is to just take the medicine if you're unwilling to make any lifestyle changes. Yeah, that's it. Listen, uh, you know, I have people who had parts of their head and neck removed for cancer and still are smoking. I mean, after a while, what are you going to do? Oh so I can't, yeah. I can't. I wouldn't, I could not be in your position. I would not be so, I, I, that would drive me crazy. You know, we we're trying to help people and there are obviously a lot, a lot more goes on before and after they see me than, than I can possibly get a grip on. But the point is yes, diet and lifestyle. But at the same time, what I have found is for every person that's eager to approach this with a diet and lifestyle change, people say, I got it. Give me a pill. So uh, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from the trenches. This is what we see. And we, I'm not going to make a judgment. Um, if this is what you want to do, okay, here are the choices. This is what we prefer. Here's our data. This is what we're seeing. We can get you better and I could show it to you. So generally people are, they came in for a reason, right? They weren't feeling that great. So we have a way of making them feel better, but sometimes it's just too much for people, especially these days, everything's too much. So, okay, we'll work with you. Well, good for you. That's not me. So that's why I'm not a doctor. Speaking of doctors, I don't know if you know Dr. John McDougal, but he's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks talking about I, digestion. I can't wait to tune in. Yeah. So, so I was rereading his book. And one of the things he said in the chapter about reflux is that high fat diets, whether it's from animal products or, or oils is generally not good for reflux. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. You know, we, we know that. I mean, one of the, again, this is the carb thing. People say, oh, you have too many carbs in your diet. Well, complex carbs, we want complex carbs. Yeah. Do I want processed carbs? No. One of the reasons I don't want processed carbs is because the chemicals in the processing loosen the, the lower esophageal sphincter. Yes, and, and certain the fats will also loosen the LES and on and on and on. I mean, there's a whole cascade of things that happen and a lot of things happening at once. So again, you know, our approach is let's get inflammation down. And even before that, what's bothering you? Let's have a look. Let's develop a plan. Obviously, I'm biased towards a, a diet and lifestyle approach. Uh, alteration, but it's a menu. Yep. So I don't know if you can answer this question, but without seeing her, but Susan says, when I eat cold potatoes, my throat closes up and I sometimes get a gag reflux. So why you keep eating them? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what could I mean, be happening? So, yeah. Okay. So, you know, is it the cold? Is it the potato? Are you allergic? There are, you know, temperature can activate the vagus nerve in a certain way. The vagus is one of the 12 cranial nerves from the brain that controls vital functions. The vagus, V-A-G-U-S, controls uh, voice, swallowing, breathing, coughing, talking, swallowing. So yes, maybe there's a vagal injury there that's activating something, but uh, you know, I, I need to know so much more. Yeah, absolutely. But if your throat closes after one time, you would think you wouldn't do it anymore, right? I mean, <laughs> well, well, so the throat closing uh, is a feeling one can get when the throat actually never closes. If you, we were talking about the shelf and the swelling in the throat, sometimes when the throat is swollen, for whatever reason, you feel tight, you feel like things are closing. Um, so we, we, under these circumstances, we obviously want to take a look and see what's going on down there. Uh, and then we could hopefully help you. Great. Jeffrey wants to know, is there a connection between acid reflux and hiatal hernia? 
Very much so. So what is a hiatal hernia? So let's get back to our little model of <laughs> our thumb, our pinky, <laughs> and our stomach here. So um, what happens is the stomach is typically below the diaphragm. The diaphragm is what separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. But sometimes a piece of the stomach can creep up above the diaphragm and get into the chest. That area is the hiatus, the stomach, the gastric hiatus, and the hernia. Hernia is when a piece of tissue comes up into a space. So hiatal hernia is a piece of the stomach above the diaphragm. A lot of people have hiatal hernia and they come into the office, ah, I have a hiatal hernia. It's the source of all my problems. Well, a one centimeter hiatal hernia, you know, quarter of inch hiatal hernia, don't get too excited about that. Now, you have a hiatal hernia the size of a grapefruit in your chest, you got a problem and you're gonna know because when you lean down to Velcro your shoes or tie your shoelaces, uh, last night's dinner ends up on your shoes. So, uh, hiatal hernia can predispose to reflux disease because it will affect the lower esophageal sphincter. So yes, there's a relationship, but if it's small, if it's sliding, meaning it doesn't stay above the diaphragm, it sometimes goes under the diaphragm back to where it should be. It may not be as much of an issue. Great. Thank you. This is an interesting question from Amy. And she's asking, do you ever see these problems commonly in children? She's noticing a lot of throat clearing and coughing in her nine-year-old son who has allergies and asthma. So is this mostly an adult condition or are kids? No, are no. So my uh, now one of my 19-year-olds at age, at day seven of life had a massive reflux event, aspiration and stopped breathing, almost died. Uh, she obviously survived. And what's the story? Infants don't have developed sphincters. So they're sloshing around. And if you really want to get into it, Dana Thompson, uh, director of pediatric otolaryngology uh, in, at Northwestern University, showed that uh, reflux disease and the numbness that results may be a cause of SIDS, of sudden infant death syndrome. So it gets very, very serious. And I'll give you one anecdote. Chef AJ, and it really sort of capsulizes why we should look at labels. So a banana has a pH of around six. Baby banana food in a jar has a pH of four. It's a hundred times more acidic because they put ascorbic acid and citric acid as a preservative, right? So knowing what we just said, right? Um, it's, it's a very scary thought and, uh, we're not fear mongering here. These are just facts. Uh, I'm not saying you'll have baby banana food in a jar and someone's going to have sudden infant death syndrome, but understand that acidity causes inflammation. Inflammation causes swelling and you lose sensitivity. So you have to be careful. Uh, no pediatrician wants their, wants their children that they're taking care of to have fruit juices because they're, forget about the lack of, of health benefits for the most part, they're inflammatory and acidic. So this sort of goes along. We, we see reflux all the time in children, but you have to think about what you see with kids. They're walking around with those juice boxes, right? They're basically pouring acid down their throat. And this particular child has asthma. Almost all lung disease has a relationship with reflux disease. Almost any lung doctor will tell you when they comprehensively treat their patients for their pulmonary problems, they almost always address reflux disease as well. There's an absolute and well-known connection. Great. Thank you. Uh, TS is saying, do you suggest eating foods with four or lower to help with reflux? No, you, you want them higher, right? Yeah. Four is a magic number. You want to be above four. Right. Is other than in your book, is there like a list that people can just start looking at the kind of foods that are above yeah, four? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, it's in the books. You have to be careful with the pH lists online because they start doing things like, well, this becomes acid in the body, things like that. I, I, I really don't want to get into that. 
you know, foods less than pH four, pepsin activation, and really want to keep it simple here. As I said earlier, I call it the dirty half dozen flavored bevies, the teas, the sodas, and then four healthies, what I call the four under four citrus, tomato sauce, vinegar, wine. I even feel bad after uh, everyone's like, oh, I, I have vinegar. I need my vinegar. I need my vinegar. I get it. I get it. Chef AJ and I are come up with it. Don't worry. We have a solution. You know, we're, we're just on the tarmac today. Let us take off. No, I do. I do. I, I now I'm realizing how much vinegar I eat, but, but I don't have reflux though. Yeah. And- so there it is. You know, it's remember people aren't coming and say to me, Hey, I just ran a four, four forty. No, they're coming into me because they can't breathe. They're coughing, their throat clearing. Some of them have been coughing for 16 years. Uh, they can't swallow on and on and on. They have symptoms. No one's rolling in to have a chit chat. Right. That's so funny. The, the thing you that the word you can't, I, I mean, when I think about people, I, I, I've, I know people that do that. And I never thought that that was reflux. Right. We want to give them a Claritin, but no, for sure. They have reflux. I mean, in the days when we used to go to events before the pandemic, right. You, the curtain's about to rise. And what do you hear? The candy's coming out. And it's a fest. Oh my right? God, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah that, it's true though. We've all seen it. You know, no, and you hear it. You know, even at your healthcare conference, you know. That is hilarious. You've, I think you've coined a new word. Diane <laughs> says, how is treatment different with silent reflux, reflux versus traditional heartburn? So that's, I mean, the, the crux of what we've been saying all along. So silent meanings, means no heartburn. Uh, what you're having are the hucking. We're back to hucking. You left it for 30 seconds. So, hey, yes. your, your block could be the hucking post. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, the huck, um, that's the treatment. Again, it's symptom driven. So, you bring up a good point. The silent is the throat. That I believe is acid influx. Be careful with those handful of the six to dirty half dozen or the four under four. Be careful with those. You know, the treatments, the smoothies and juices and a variety of things, a handful of things actually to stay away from. Heartburn, if you're having heartburn, then you're including some of the things we talked about earlier, coffee, chocolate, alcohol, mint, raw onion and garlic. We could go on from there, but that's the basic dividing line, uh, influx versus reflux. Right. It's okay if it's not flavored, right? Even Unflavored, though it's- I don't care. Because there are people, yeah. there's, there's some... The things you read about online, oh, it's the carbonation, the carbonation. And yes, bubbles can come up and cause irritation. But more and more, um, I'm what we're seeing is it's the acidity more than the bubbles. Bubbles, I don't get too excited about. Flavored bubbles, I get very excited about. Flavored bubbles. I love that. You have a way with words. Tia says, I heard that having acid reflux can cause asthma in adults. Do you think this is true? I think we just covered that, right? I know, Anyone? but sometimes the question. I'm, okay, sometimes. let's let's talk. Okay, so a hundred percent yes. I'm very close with pulmonologists all over our New York metropolitan area, and really from around the country. We've been doing this for 32 years. You, you, we get to know some of the, the 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 great players in the field, and yes, uh, every great respiratory center has people that address and treat reflux disease, 100%. You could maybe have, you know, I was thinking of the next book for you, you can have an exercise portion. It could be called huffing and puffing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, as it turns out, uh, in the acid watcher diet, we, we have an exercise section, but we don't call it something cool like huffing and puffing. No, exactly. I'm telling you, AJ, we got to... No, let's let's I I like this going. I like you. So the question is, is since I'm vegan and most of my audience is how many recipes in your cookbook would be suitable for a whole food plant based eater? So so in in the acid watcher diet, 80 percent plant. So it's 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 there. We're edging there. Uh, My partners at ENT and Allergy Associates, who are what I call Esselstein vegans, no oil. Oh, can I have them on the show? Uh, yeah, I mean, get I, get Craig Salvin like on the show. Get uh, oh my god, uh, that's Guy amazing! Lynn on the show, yeah, and and Zalvin just wrote a seminal book on on uh, reflux disease. He was one of my former residents way back when in the in the nineties at, at Columbia University, 
and went on to great things uh, in his own right. Yeah, he's a huge proponent of a uh, whole food plant-based diet. Well, send him along. This is fantastic. I love it. Do you Absolutely. still follow your protocol for the most part? Me? Yeah. So every day I have a smoothie before I, I, I do my three mile walk to work. Uh, and I, when it's not torrential out there, I'll, I'll try and walk home. So yes, this is the way we eat at home. And listen, I, you know, my spouse is, is the creative genius there. So, uh, I, I benefit from, from all these, uh, uh, acid watcher friendly food experiments. Yeah, that's so cool. I don't know if I told you this. So I was actually named in Hebrew before my parents gave me an English name because they just didn't, I don't know. They just thought, it, I wish they had kept it. I, my, my, I was named Aviva. That was my name oh my when God. I was born. And then they later on changed it to Abby, which I didn't like because it was called Flabby Abby. But so, I think, you know, we're supposed to we're supposed to do something together, Aviva and Aviv, you know? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, AJ. I am ready. Yeah, well, again, yeah, you're great. Really, really a lot of fun talking to you. So other than getting your book um, and I hear you have a Facebook group, how else can people support your work? Do you like them to follow you on Instagram or? Yeah, I mean, Instagram, it's at Dr. Aviv, Dr. spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-A-V-I-V. Uh, we, I will, I'm hoping to get uh, back to posting uh, more recipes. I, I stopped several months ago uh, the chef AJ posting about this wonderful event was the first post that I've done in, in months and months. Um, and maybe you've inspired me to get back to doing that more regularly. Uh, we, we have been overwhelmed with our COVID patients and their issues, and it's just taken a lot out of us. Right. Well, great. And the lady with the 18 questions, she's got to come in because that's just too many for a show, right? I mean, even maybe, maybe, maybe her, her local healthcare professional has the answers too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it seems like she knows your protocol and is in your Facebook group and, and wanted a chance for a one-on-one, -on -one, but it, and there was just, it was so many, and there was so many highly pers you know, I just couldn't. Yeah. It, it, as look, I, 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 I don't make these rules uh, on, on the medical legal aspects and what we could do. And initially when the pandemic began, I was all excited because I thought, oh, great, I could. And boy, I, they, they, they took me aside and explained to me what's up and I just yeah. couldn't move. Because you really do have to look, like you said, there's certain specialties where you can, I mean, because I've done virtual and, and it's been great, but you, you know, you got you to gotta look, you got to be able to see. We got to look because it, it makes all the difference. I'll give you an example. Someone's chaching. Okay, is this a reflux chach or is this a cancer chach? Is this a Parkinson disease chach, right? It all sounds the same. So that's why we got to take a look. Yeah, I remember I like I, said, I used to produce conferences every year and I've done 19 and I there would be three days and by the end of it, I just would lose my voice. And I remember going to a, an ENT and he did that thing and it, it was so fun, like looking at my vocal cords and all that kind of stuff. It sounds like you went to an expert. Yeah, yeah, it was really it was like it was kind of freaky in a way, but it was kind of fun, like, you know, you know, because you got to see, you know. Yeah, you get to see it. Yeah. So that's the great thing because. You can, you can actually see that what you're doing, how you're making the changes will impact your body. And usually within a hundred days, you can see the changes. It's that fast. Yeah. Well, his advice was don't talk so much, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is kind of hard when that's what you no, do. No, no, you but... can't tell that to Chef AJ. No, I'm just that's kidding. The I'm wrong kidding. Approach. Come on. I'm talk kidding. Talk more. Right. right. But, but when you, when I was doing conferences, it was just too much talking. And so if I ever were to do one again, I would have somebody help me. It's really hard when well, you just also there's it's dry in those rooms. There's not enough humidification. There's all sorts of things that uh, sort of lined up against you. Yeah. Well, Sunita says, thank you for bringing us such inspirational and informative speakers. Well, it's certainly been a lot of fun talking to you. I really, you seem like a wonderful doctor and person, and uh, I can't wait to collaborate further and meet some of your, your Look, looking, looking forward to that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Rady. you so much. It thank you for been, all you're doing for us. Of course. It's been my pleasure. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 3 p.m. when we have Ms. Fit Vegan on. She's making strawberry daiquiri raw ice cream. And I think it's going to be over four because she, I don't know. She's using a banana and strawberries. So are we okay with that? Or...
What do you think? Oh, yeah, it's it's going to neutralize. You're you're. This sounds yummy. Yeah, I love I'm, it. I'm, I'm going to go to the kitchen and prepare it. Let's neutralize. I love it. Let's neutralize. Thanks again, Dr. Aviv. You're